kind of got the chills for you as you were reading that. As many times as I've read that passage, it is pressed the truth. Plus, church needs leadership. And so, you know what he's going to do? I'm going to talk about myself because I'm not one anymore I'm with y'all guys. You know, the 50 years, by the way, the 50 years I pastored, I always considered myself more of a, learner, a layman than part of the clergy. I didn't like that term, clergy. It's like they're up here and we peasants are down here. God is going to take the, here's what he's going to do. Because Ellen said this. She said, it will be seen that the Lord has taken his own work into his own hand. I'm looking forward to that day. Some of our brightest lights are going out, she also said. Brothers and sisters, we're going to have to figure out that fear is not part of the latter rain. Amen. Jesus is not the God of fear. And I'll just say one thing relative to this. 15 days to flatten the curve is now up to 180 something days to flatten the curve. If you want to read what I really think about it, and I'll shut up about this issue that we're facing. Read Dr. Joseph Lapado. I think I'm saying his name. L-A-P-A-D-O. I think he may be from Nigeria. As a doctor, he's an MD from Harvard and a PhD. He said, we must learn how to live with, not for. Are you following my drift? Yeah. <laughs> no casualties, no survivors. This message today, it really should be in two or three parts. I apologize because my brain just would not shut down the hospital. All week. For good, for evil, for weal and woe. And I'm going to say this a bit more later, but those of you who were here three weeks ago, when I gave the first time I've ever tried to wrestle with Revelation 17, for those of you who weren't here, basically you may recall, Revelation 17 has never been, to my understanding, properly because I didn't know myself. I'm not saying I understood it. It's not been properly expounded upon until 1963. That was 56 years ago. A little book that was in this library and it's, it's been brought out. Yeah. I intended to bring mine. Somebody can take that out if they like. I'm glad to know it's already making the rounds here in uh, New Smyrna. Mary James read it? Read it twice, Mary James, I said. It's because it's out of print. Can't even find it on Amazon. That was doing a good job. It's called The Time of the End. Revelation chapter 17. I'll just quickly tell you, who is this guy, George McCready Price? I'd heard of him. I think my daddy, who's been dead for a long time, mentioned him a few times. He was born in 1870. He died the year he finished this book at age 93. So praise God, at 93, his brain was still cooking. But in a nutshell, what he was saying then was that we are living. Okay, back up there. Revelation 17, we'll go there in a few minutes. You have this scarlet beast, and on his back is a what? The woman. The woman. Is she a pure woman, or is she a streetwalker? She's a streetwalker. On that beast, there are seven heads. Okay? Which represents the seven periods of earth's history in which Satan's method of government, notice that key word there, government is exercised in the world. Who you identify as the first head makes all the difference in the world. Most scholars among us 
have identified the first head as Assyria. Wrong. Now, that should be more gentle. No. <laughs> no, it's wrong. So then, and then they follow with Egypt, and then they go with Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, and they say the seventh head is the papacy. Okay? Partially right, according to McCready, and I think he's dead on right. Because if you start where he starts, which is where the Bible starts, the Bible, not some intellectual scholar, but the Bible starts with Babylon. That's the first hit. In fact, Babylon did not be begin before there was even an Assyria or Egypt. It goes back to Nimrod right after the flood. So you have Babylon, then you've got Medo-Persia, then you've got Greece, then you've got pagan Rome. Then who's number five? Papal Rome. Who's number six? Us. Us. U.S. U.S. Becomes the false prophet. And when it fully matures, watch this. You hit the seventh head, which is the image to the beast. And then the eighth head that's talking about in Revelation 17, which is the composite of the, of the, uh, of the beast, is the rejuvenated papacy. We are at the very toenails of the sixth head. Because America is on the verge. I'm summarizing the whole message because I'm not going to give all these notes today. We'll be here at 1 o'clock. So America is on the verge of, be, of developing fully the image to the beast. And when it does, according to the spirit of prophecy, according to Revelation 13, that second beast will extend power back to who? A rejuvenated papacy. Who rules for just a short time? We're going on. Because there's going to be a people who vindicate the character of God. Yeah. Not for salvation, but out of love for Him. That's it in a nutshell. And at that point, there'll be no casualties and there'll be no survivors. Depending on what side you stand on. There's only two. I started to wear a black tie with this black suit this morning to kind of illustrate no casualties, no survivors. But my wife kind of talked me out of it. <laughs> yes, this is kind of this is a continuation. Can I go to 12:30? Absolutely. Oh yes. Yeah, uh, no, this this message is today is a continuation. And a review of our earlier study on Revelation 17. One of the most brilliant statistic tactics, and I say this as a history minor from college a long time ago, and I didn't learn history in college. Like I've learned history the last three, four years. One of his most brilliant tactics is the undermining of spiritual, historical reality. I'll give you the most prominent one in America today. And brothers and sisters, if you think this pulpit is going to be political today, then you need a fresh idea of what politics is. Principles are part of politics. What's not appropriate in this pulpit is partisan politics. Where I say what I say because I'm a whatever part. We're not going there. God doesn't want us to, and I understand why. Amen. The most egregious example of that today is the New York Times 1619 Project, which is being taught in over 3,500 public schools this year. Probably double, triple that next year. What does that do? 
that made, it undermines the, the fact that God established the principles of this country. Amen. It is a direct attack on a holy God. And I can name the name of a college president of one of us who says we need to study that because it's good stuff. If you ask me after, I'll tell you who it is. But that's as far as I'm going to go. Because it makes me angry. But my Bible says be angry and say no. I'll talk about that in a second. A study of church history as compared and contrasted with our day that we're living produces a fascinating distinction. During the Dark Ages, the Bible was what? Banned. It was banned. Remember, Luther had to find a Bible hanging on the wall of the monastery before he discovered righteousness by faith. It wasn't even available to him to take home, and he was a monk. Today, the Bible's not banned. Yet, probably never will be. But what is banned is a clear reading of Scripture. Clear meanings of Scripture are being distorted and reinterpreted all around us. It was happening in Ellen White's day. She called it higher criticism. Today we might call it historical critical criticism where the human mind becomes the ultimate arbiter or determiner of what is true. Well, I mean, I know what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, but that's, that's passe. We've grown beyond that. I'll tell you, even more troubling one to me than even I should have said. This is, yeah, this is even more troubling. I misspoke about New York Times. I'll read the number two. This is even more troubling. Separation of church and state has been reinvented and transformed into the separation of God and state, which was never the intent of our founders. It was never the intent of God. Amen. I'm going to say it again. I've said it in this pulpit before, but it can't be said too often because you don't see it here hardly anywhere. I got this from a secular, no, this a Jewish guy, thinker that I have a high regard for. Separation of church and state is biblical for our day. And it's in our founding documents. But what is not in those documents is separation of God and the state. Amen. That's why I resent the state shutting down churches. They have no right to do that. And we let it happen because we have bought the lie of separation of God and state. Then they need to tear down, well, just rip out the Declaration of Independence. Just rip out the Constitution. Just tear down all the... Yeah, that's what they want to do, isn't it? People are being doxxed. You know what doxxed means? Publicly exposed for standing up for truth. You know the frontline doctors, for example? You know the frontline front, front doctors? Where how many of them are there? Dozens, hundreds, who are treating this disease every day. Their website was taken down by the CDC. They were doctors. Yeah. Why? Because they weren't following the company line. Yes, we're living in a time where truth is being trumped by emotion. Truth is being trumped by fake compassion. Fake, fake compassion. Those of us who believe in truth are being called troublers of the people. You know, there was a group back in the 16th century who stood for truth over tradition and emotion. They were called the Huguenots of France. I've been wanting to buy that portrait just as a reminder. My wife won't let me, and she's right. 
be a hand on the wall. Just to just remind of the St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Mm -hmm. Over a period of weeks and months, 70,000 humans <coughs> were slaughtered. Why? Because they live in truth. If you think we're not headed for that again, then you need to get out of your comfort zone. Many in America, egged on by radicals and their Praetorian Guard, the media, are on the same wavelength as the rebels of the French Revolution. And most of the church slumbers on. Let me read you a quote. You still believe in this little lady who wrote these books? If you don't, then you're in the wrong church. You need to find another one. There will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies which is satanic. She wrote that herself in 1909. She said these words. This is from a little book called Education. Now the next quarter is his own education. I wonder how to hear this quote. Anarchy is seeking 1903. This was written. You know what was happening in 1903? When you hear these days, you ought to think, what's going on? Man? Of course, it takes a big picture, not just a little picture, to see this. In 1903, America was moving rapidly toward the left. You had people like, he yeah, wasn't president yet, but you had people like Woodrow Wilson who was writing such things as, yes, I know America was built on Newtonian principles. What does that mean? Newtonian cosmology. What does that mean? That means that God is the center of the universe. That's what that means. Sir Isaac Newton, you've all heard of him. God is the center of the universe. Wilson said, no, 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 no. We must move America away from Newtonian principles to Darwinian principles. Where, what does that mean? Not just evolution. Not just evolution. Darwinian principles means man is the center of the universe. And that's exactly where we are. That's why we're the sixth head, get ready to extend the image or, or, or um, reach the hand across the abyss and create. We're not the image of the beast yet. You know why we're not the image of the beast yet? We haven't produced the image to the beast? I'll come back to that, I hope. Don't let me forget it. Anarchy is seeking to sweep away all law. That's what anarchy is, without law. And it's being egged on by politicians, it's being egged on by the media, 90% of it. It's seeking to sweep away all law, not only divine law, but human law. The centralizing of wealth and power. This is 1903. 1903, you had the so called robber barons. Those guys were small potatoes compared to Silicon Valley. There's the real robber barons. They don't control finances, they're controlling media. You see that? There's your robber barons. Plus they're worth infinitely more than infinitely. Much, much more than what the robber barons of her day <clears throat> would be worth. The centralizing of wealth and power the vast combinations for the enrichment of the few at the expense of the many. The combinations of the poorer classes for the defense of their interests and claims. The spirit of earned unrest, of riot, heard that word? Protest, not the riots. There is a difference. Protest is constitutional. But when they morph into riot, riots, they're not still protests. They're anarchy. Of riot and bloodshed, the worldwide dissemination. What's this? The worldwide. This is where McCready Price got his thinking on the sixth head moving into the seventh. The worldwide disseminations of dissemination of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution. This is present truth. This is present truth. All tending to involve the whole world in a struggle 
similar to that which convulsed France. Convulsed France. She said a little bit later, and this would have been about 1907, 1908. I'm not going to quote it and bring in the book. It's volume 8, page 307. She said, it's our responsibility to know the progress of these events. So we have been taught, and here I'm speaking out loud here, but there's only 25 of us. You can share it to them with millions. I don't care. We have, been, we have made the mark of the beast our only reason to exist. We're going to avoid that. That is baloney. By the time the mark of the beast is, it's too late. We better understand the events moving up to that. Otherwise, we will be deceived. Hmm. All tending to involve the whole world in the struggle. Nearly six years ago, I stop and pray. Father, I gotta stop. I gotta stop. Unless you take over the rest of this, I'll mess it up really bad. Thank you for hearing our prayer. This prayer. That you take over in Jesus' name. Amen. One more quote. This is also from Price I got, from volume 9. She wrote that in 1909. Ladies, 81 years old. She said in volume 9, page 20, she says, are we going to wait to all hell come prayer for us in Are we going to wait to all hell breaks loose to warn the wicked, or are we going to warn them now? Mm -hmm. To free the wrath that is to come. It's like we were talking about in Sabbath school. Neutrality is not an option now. Neutrality is not an option. Six years ago, it'll be six years in February, actually, I delivered a sermon, the memory of which makes me cringe. It was likely the most unbalanced and distorted sermon I've ever given. Hopefully you've discovered that the man or woman who stands in this sacred desk is a fallible human being. It is only as the message is rooted in the Word of God that one has the hope, if not the assurance, that a blessing is being offered up. Therefore, it's vital that you, the listener, be not only hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word. Which means, I've discovered, at least two things. What does it mean to be a, a doer of the Word? One is that your responsibility as a listener must be confirmed by your own study. Yes. You can't depend on 3ABN or Doug Batchelor or Mark Finley or whoever, God forbid, as the source of what you believe. It must be this. There is, they're fallible too. Even Ellen White cringed at the term prophetess. She said, I'm a messenger. I'm a lesser light pointing to the greater light. If you study this like you should, you wouldn't even need me. You know what? You would see events as they're unfolding. That's why I question these guys who don't see some of this stuff that this little old dumb preacher sees and say, are you really studying this Word of God? Tyranny is tyranny. No matter where it arises, it rears its ugly head. Yes. So you have a responsibility, and of course, number two, that that assimilated Word is put into practice in mind and action. We are told, and I'm going to say it again, we must not be reflectors of other people's thoughts, but dig for ourselves. If we discover we're wrong, don't be afraid to admit that we're wrong. Even to somebody who disagrees with us. I've even had to say fairly recently, everything you said about me was right. Somebody knows me pretty well and that's good for that. Is that hard for you to say? Yeah, it's hard, but is it good? Is it cathartic? Is it cleansing to say, yeah, I'm wrong? The great Apostle Paul was lived with the fact that he was wrong. 
before his encounter with Jesus Christ. He was wrong. And he would talk about it. Do you think Psalm 51 is going to be ripped out of Scripture when we get to heaven? David's going to be standing there. Yeah, I'm the one who did that. And I'm the one, by God's grace, who repented too, so it's all been swept aside. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, in that sermon six years ago, I taught a view of God that was truncated. That's a good word, attitude, vocabulary. You know what it means? Truncated means to shorten or to cut off the top or cut off the bottom. It's kind of like, do you ever, have you ever heard anybody tell a long story that has a punchline? And they just leave the console out. Is that frustrating? Oh my goodness. Why did you waste my time? Or they tell some nice clean joke and they I do, do this all the time. How does that end? I just truncated. Does that make sense? I truncated a view of God. In short, the, the sermon was a failure to engage the whole context of the point that I was trying to make. And what I ended up doing, <clears throat> and if I get one more shot at that particular pulpit, because I know where I was, I'll make it right. Hopefully this is right. <clears throat> what I ended up doing was taking the God of Revelation and making him into the contemporary popular image of God just being a nice guy. Specifically, one who punishes only by cause and effect. That is, he does not engage in direct punishment or retribution for the criminal act of sin. In other words, Dale, what you did was he's only a lamb. He's not a lion. You have a problem with that? That's what we're getting in most places these days. God is just a man. And he is the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. For years, intellectual theologians in their commonly elitist way have dismissed active punishment by God for human crimes by saying, those folks in the Old Testament, as much they're saying, were primitive and unenlightened. So God had to deal with them as primitive and unenlightened cultures. We believe that the Bible properly understood, and we're here to teach you poor peasants, is really a passive God who generally deals only in cause and effect. 30 years ago, when I first started my first district in State College, Pennsylvania, there was a big blue blow up on me. Everybody loved this book yep. called Who's Afraid of the Old Testament God? Mm -hmm. I remember it's called in 1990. I used to have it on my shelf. Oh, it's just as cause and effect, God. You know, like touch the stove and you get burned. It's cause and effect. But direct active punishment for sin? Nah. Remember our scripture text, the preachers of Malachi's day were airbrushing out the law. And when you obscure the law, you also obscure the gospel. Because it doesn't have the effect to transform a life and to change a heart. You also airbrush sin out of lives and the civilization, civilization progresses to collapse is where we're, we're, we're beyond the point of no return. You know that. Yeah. I think I might have mentioned this pulpit again before. That we have a friend, Stacy and I had lunch with him about three years ago. Four? Rob Gagnon. Rob Gagnon is an intellectual, but he's got his feet on the ground. I like that. This is a doctorate in the New Testament from Princeton. And he wrote a book 
that got him fired and took a number of years, probably 15 years, but he ended up getting him fired as a tenured professor. I didn't think tenured professors could get fired, but he did at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. He's not a Seventh-day Adventist, he's a Presbyterian. He wrote in that book, around, wrote in around 2000, 2001, 